Well, I want to welcome you to church this morning. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor at this church. If you're new, I'm glad that you're here. And we're in the middle of this series called The God I Never Knew. And in this series, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And we call it the God I never knew because many Christians, um, they don't hear a lot about the Holy Spirit. And maybe you grew up in a background where you didn't hear a lot or you're new to Christianity or uh, there's various reasons. Maybe you've just been afraid of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you heard some things about him and, and you've been a little gun shy there. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that he's the third person of the Trinity, that he's our friend and that he helps us. So we should want to have a relationship with him. The only person who does not want you to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit is your enemy, the devil. God wants you to have a relationship that's healthy and thriving with the Holy Spirit. And so you need to understand that as we talk about this topic, I know there are aspects of this that are controversial, and I'm okay with that. Okay, so one of the things I appreciate about a lot of non-denominational churches is that they avoid... Uh, secondary issues, and they focus on primary issues. And there's good to that because they're saying we're going to focus on the most essential issues, the, the basics, and we're not going to argue about controversial secondary issues. The problem, though, is that if you avoid all controversial topics, you'll miss out on a lot of helpful teaching. Okay, so here's how you should talk about controversial or secondary topics as a Christian. One, we don't debate the essential topics, like the close-handed topics, like, for example, Jesus is the Son of God. I'm not debating that. That is an essential doctrine of being a Christian. But there are secondary issues that we're going to talk about, uh, like one of them today. And th that's how you talk about them. You look at what the Bible says. You say what the Bible says and not more than what the Bible says. That's, that's what I do. And so we wanna take the scriptures, exposit them, so we wanna understand them in the context and then how they apply to our lives. And we wanna say, well, look, if we disagree, then fine, we can still be friends. Uh, and you can disagree with me today and still be a member of this church. But I'm gonna talk to you about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that you can believe in the full person and power of the Holy Spirit and not be a crazy person. That's very important to me that you understand that. I was flipping through the channels the other day and I saw a church service taking place, um, a church in the valley here. And I'm always curious what other churches are doing. So I stop and I start watching. And I just gotta tell you, these people, God bless them, they were nuts. <laughs> just totally nuts. Like I'm watching this going, no, please. Cause like this is the reason that some Christians are afraid of the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about his power, his love, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that he has for you as described in Galatians 5, so you can be fruity but not nuts. <laughs> and you don't need to be afraid. I'm gonna talk today about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm gonna ask this question and answer it hopefully for you. Does he baptize? Maybe you'd say, I've heard of this baptism in the Holy Spirit. I've got some questions. It makes me a little nervous. Well, we're gonna talk about it. There are three baptisms that I want to talk to you about today. And we're just going to go through a lot of scripture. Is that okay? Yes. They'll all be up on the screen so you can read along. First, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus, into the body of Christ. This is what happens when you believe, when you place your faith in Jesus, that he is the risen son of God. You say, I trust you, Lord, to save me and forgive me of my sins. The Holy Spirit performs this baptism where he immerses you and fully connects you into the body of Christ. So this is the baptism that the Holy Spirit performs. You could call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he is the one who does it. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. And I want you to understand that it's the Holy Spirit who does the baptizing there. It's, it's in his power. It's by his grace, through his working. We're made a part of the body of Christ. And this happens to every believer who places his or her faith in Jesus, okay? So this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to get confused with what we're gonna also talk about, the baptism in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. It's important that you use the right phrasing because it can cause people confusion and they get confused about the differences. So we're gonna talk about that. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number two, disciples baptize us in water. 
When we place our faith in Jesus, we get baptized in water. And here's Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, that's water baptism, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So baptism in water is a sign, but it's also more than a sign. There's a spiritual dynamic there. But it's a sign to everyone that you have died to your, own se- your old self, like you were buried, that guy is dead, that, that gal is dead, like Jesus went into the grave. You're leaving that person in the water, and as you come out, it's symbolized, you're a new creation in Jesus. Like Jesus came out of the grave, you come up out of the water, and you say, I am new. I am cutting off the old person. And this is an important part of our walk with God. That's why Jesus said that we should all do this, okay? In the same way, it's interesting that in the Old Testament, the Israelites or the Hebrew people, as they came out of slavery in Egypt, they had their own type of baptism. Scripture says that they were baptized in the sea. They went across the Red Sea, and the Bible says that they left their old life in the sea. They left their enemy literally in the sea and their old life of slavery. And so scripture refers to that as their baptism in the sea. That's amazing imagery of our baptism in water that was going to come. Now, some people argue against the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a separate experience, and they use this verse in Ephesians 4, 5, and I want to point it out to you. It says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so they say, well, there's only one baptism. Okay, well, I just want to point some things out here. It also says there is one Lord, but we know that God exists as three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're three in one, and they all agree in the same way. There are three baptisms and they all agree. And you can even read in 1 John 5, 7, and 8 where it says there are three that testify on earth, the blood, the water, and the spirit. And they all agree as one. So we see that we can get baptized into Jesus by the Holy Spirit when we believe. We get baptized in water. So people who say there's only one baptism, they already are contradicting themselves because they already believe in two baptisms, both being by being baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus and the body of Christ and in water. There's, there's at least two they're admitting, okay? But then some of you need to also be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just point out real quick before we go on, some of you guys still need to get baptized in water, yeah. all right? Maybe you were baptized in water as a child before you even believed, and then you got saved later. You need to get baptized in water, That's something we're supposed to do. We're supposed to believe and be baptized. All right? So don't be uh, embarrassed or afraid to get baptized in water. Jesus actually commanded us to be baptized in water. It's an important step in your walk with God that you go forward um, and you get baptized in water and you experience that since Jesus said to do it. So if you got baptized as a baby, um, great, I guess, but do it again as a believer. Okay, here's the third baptism. Jesus baptizes us in or with the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, 11. This is John the Baptist talking and he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Who's that about? Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Remember, we talked about how on the day of Pentecost, fire appeared above them when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is John the Baptist, so we already have proof that there's at least one Baptist who believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was a dorky pastor joke. Okay, and I want to make one point, one point. He was not speaking to the 12 disciples. Some people say, well, that was just for the 12 disciples. Jesus had not yet called the 12 disciples when John the Baptist said this. This happened in Matthew 3. The next chapter, Jesus calls the 12 disciples. So he wasn't talking to the 12 disciples. He wasn't talking to the 120 in the upper room. He was talking to all believers that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Some people say now that the first baptism I talked about and the third are the same. They get confused. But I just want to point out they cannot be the same. They cannot be, not just logically, not just theologically, but even grammatically, they can't be the same. 
Because as I said, there are different people doing the baptism. The first baptism that we experience into the body of Christ is performed by the Holy Spirit. And no Christian denies that because we know it's by the Holy Spirit that our heart is regenerated. It's by the Holy Spirit that we are connected to the body of Christ and made new, right? So we all agree on that. Then the third baptism we just talked about is by Jesus. John the Baptist just said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to go on. I'm going to give you more evidence of that. Here's how important the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for us. It's so important that God put it in all four of his gospels. Okay, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. That's why they're called the synoptic gospels. They're the similar. They're, the, they're very much the same. They all three record the last year of Jesus's ministry. They start after the death of John the Baptist. The gospel of John focuses on the first two years of Jesus's ministry. And so they have different elements. The gospel of John has some things in it that the other three don't, like the woman at the well and the woman caught in adultery and Jesus turning water into wine. He likes to party, good things like that. Um, So sometimes though, you'll read the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you'll be like, I read, I read this and then it's like, I'm pretty sure I already read this. And then if you keep going, you get to you know, Luke and you're like, I'm definitely sure I already read this. They're very similar. But then there's a very few things that are included in all four. Here's what they are. The birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which we can all agree that's like the core of the gospel, very important. The feeding of the 5,000 and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I already read to you from Matthew. Now I'll just give you Mark real quick. Mark 1.8. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.16. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That sounds very familiar. But then there's also John. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we know that Jesus was baptized in water. The Holy Spirit descended on him and remained on him. And he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And also he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. So now I want to talk about salvation, water, and the Spirit. Salvation, water, and the Spirit we're going to talk about. And we're going to kind of draw this out. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus our example? Yes, not a trick question. Jesus is definitely our example. Okay, but then we got to apply this now to us. So first, was Jesus saved? No, okay, because when we're saved, the Bible says we're born again. That's because we're born into this world with a sin corrupted spirit. And so when we place our faith in Jesus, we have to be born again spiritually. Was Jesus born again? No, because he was born perfectly the first time. So he didn't need to be saved. He came to do the saving. So then we ask, was he baptized with water? Yes, John the Baptist Baptize him with water. And you can read about that. And then we ask, was he baptized with the Holy Spirit? Because some people will say, well, Jesus wasn't baptized with the Holy Spirit. But I would say, yes, he was. Because as soon as he was baptized in water, the Bible says that the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. It descended on him. And a lot of times scripture uses the word, it was poured out upon, it fell upon. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit as well. Let me just point out, it descended on him like a dove. Like a dove, that's a simile. But you could take it out of the sentence. The Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. Some people get that confused and they'll say, a dove descended on him like the Holy Spirit. That's weird. We don't need that. Like, ah, like a dove flies down like on your shoulder and you're like, oh, hey, you know, that, that's not what we need. Um, the Holy Spirit descended on him, okay? So Jesus gives us his example. Now let me ask you, if Jesus Christ needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do you? Let me read to you from Acts chapter two. We've been talking about salvation and water and the spirit. We're gonna see these three baptisms. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, that's salvation. 
and be baptized. There's water baptism. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. It's the promise. This is the same promise Jesus told his disciples to wait for. It's for everyone who the Lord our God calls to himself. Okay, so people will say, well, that was just for the first people, the first people in the church, the, the, the disciples, and we don't need that today. Wait a second. The promise is for all of them, their children, their grandchildren, their grandbabies. Did it stop? No, it says for everyone whom the Lord our God calls himself. If you're a Christian, God has called you, right? Has God called you? Then yes, the promise is for you. Now, we believe that when you place your faith in Jesus, we all receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like taking a drink of the Holy Spirit, right? You receive him and he's inside of you. When we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a second or separate experience, it's like the other types of baptisms. It's complete immersion. It's like if I took a bath in my tea, right? It's, it's totally covered from head to toe. Okay, so we all agree that we receive the Holy Spirit when we're saved, but that there is a separate experience. That's what I'm trying to talk to you about. And now I'm going to read you the first of three, what I would call rock solid convincing passages that will help you understand this. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, they believed, they were saved. As he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. That's water baptism, both men and women. Okay, so if all you need is to believe and be baptized, they should be good, right? But let me go on. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and said, congrats, you've got everything you need. No, that's not what it says. If you're reading along, okay, I'm just checking if you're paying attention. Um, they came down and they said, uh, we're going to pray for you. They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had only been water baptized. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So if you get all the Holy Spirit you need when you place your faith in Jesus, then apparently Peter and John were not taught good theology because they came to pray for them to receive more. It says right there in scripture, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. They did receive the indwelling, but they had not received fully the Holy Spirit. It says right there, he had not yet fallen on any of them. So now we read the second of three rock solid convincing passages. We're gonna continue. Acts chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, this is Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote one third of the New Testament. We can all agree that the Apostle Paul had a pretty good handle on theology, considering he was taught by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, um, his understanding of salvation. So if we got all the Holy Spirit we need at salvation, why did Paul ask him, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Some of you need to really wrap your minds around that. And then it goes on and it says, and they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So apparently they went to the same church that some of you guys went to. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized. That's with water in the name of Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. So we just see another example that they believed, they were baptized, and then they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. He came upon them. Now, some people will say, well, that was only in Acts 2, but we just saw it wasn't. People will say that was a one-time thing. And we see that it wasn't. It happened in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 8, when we see it happening there, that was five years after the day of Pentecost. 
In Acts chapter 10, when the Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, that was 10 years after the day of Pentecost. And in Acts 19, what we just read, that was 25 years after the day of Pentecost. So it was not just a one-time experience. This was an ongoing experience of believers that there had been a, a baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ, but Jesus also wanted to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so then we're gonna see this go on and continue. Okay, we know, I wanna just point this out before we go on. When we believe, we are saved. We're baptized into the body of Christ. Just believing in Jesus, that is all you need to go to heaven. Let's just get that straight and clear. That's all you need. And we get a perfect example of that from the thief on the cross who said to Jesus while he was being crucified, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember the guy had not been water baptized. I'm sure he would have loved to come down off the cross and get water baptized. He'd be like, I'll come right back, I promise, right? But he wasn't water baptized. And Jesus said, you're gonna be with me in heaven. So I think Jesus knows how it works. Okay. Then two, we know when we're baptized in water, it's a sign that the old person is buried and cut off. That's why you need to do this. That's why you need to do this. And it's part of getting a separation from your past life. And then when I get baptized in or with the Holy Spirit by Jesus, I get the power to walk and live in the new life as a new creation. So this is another thing. We need that as well. It's for our benefit. So ask yourself, do I only have two baptisms? Have I fully received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on my life? Have I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in my life fully that Jesus wants to give me? Some people, they still, they want to fight this and they'll say, well, I already received all the Holy Spirit I need when I was saved. That's what they were taught. So it's not really always their fault. They were just taught that. Uh, I'm just going to show you another, my third rock solid convincing passage. And this is the one that, that convinced me the most. I think this is my favorite. This really makes it all come together and lock down tightly. John 20, verse 21. This is the day that Jesus re resurrected from the grave. His disciples were hiding in a locked room and then Jesus appeared among them. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the father has sent me. Even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. I don't know if a lot of people just miss this verse, but Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. And apparently it was like, Right, But he had good breath, I'm sure, because he was like resurrected Jesus. You were like, yes. So, okay, let me just ask you the question. Let's think through this logically. If Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, do you think they received the Holy Spirit? Okay, so we're all on the same page. Obviously, they did. They had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in them like we all do when we place our faith in Jesus because they obviously believed in him, right? They were scared, they were hiding, poof, there's Jesus. He's alive, he's alive, he's got the nail scars in his hand. He's like, I'm alive. They obviously believed they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now here's why I point that out, because I want you to see that before we go forward to Luke 24. In Luke 24, now we're reading about the end of the 40 days that the resurrected Jesus was ministering on the earth. This is 40 days later. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You can go on to Acts chapter one, verse four. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart Jerusalem. This is still Jesus talking, but to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Well, wait a second. Did Jesus forget that he had already given them the Holy Spirit? We all read it, John 20, he'd already given them, received the Holy Spirit, but now he's telling them to wait for power from on high. Jesus lays it out for us there pretty clearly. I hope you're seeing this. I don't know how you can miss it. There's another experience where you need power from on high. He was about to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And I'll just point this out. Jesus, his last words were not go. His last words were wait. 
His last words were, wait until you receive this power. He wants us all to go, but he wants us to have that power because he knows if you don't have the power, nothing you do will work. It won't work. And I know this is true. I read about Dwight L. Moody. He was a, a famous evangelist in uh, the 1800s, into the 1800s, coming into the 1900s in Chicago. And he was, had, had a really uh, good church, but he talks about in his autobiography how he wanted to do great things for God, and yet he felt kind of empty, like his ministry wasn't effective, and like he was doing it all in his own flesh, in his own strength, so he was frustrated. And he talks about how he noticed there were two little old ladies in his church sitting on the front row, and they were praying during all of his sermons. And he was kind of irritated, like, stop praying right now. Pay attention to what I'm saying. So he, he talked to them, like, in private. He pulled them aside. He's like, why are you praying during my sermons? And they said, we're praying for you. And he said, why? You should pray for unsaved people. And they said, we're praying for you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, I thought I already had that. He said, I graciously told them that I already had that, and they graciously kept praying for me. <laughs> so he went home, he searched the scriptures, and he became convinced that he needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit the way the disciples were in Acts chapter 2. And so he had this deep longing that developed in him to have more of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And he goes on to ex explain how he was in New York, he was walking down Wall Street, and the Holy Spirit fell upon him so powerfully that he was overcome and he couldn't even continue walking down the road. He had to like kind of dip off the road and he locked himself in a room for a couple hours. He said the power of God was on him so strongly that he had to ask God to make it stop. <laughs> he said, I felt like I was gonna die because there was so much joy overwhelming my heart. And he said, it felt like waves of liquid love washing over me. And that it was really interesting when I read that because it reminded me of my experience when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I just felt this overwhelming awareness and sense of God's love just kind of coursing through me. It was so unexplainable. From there, his ministry went on to explode in effectiveness. He says, I was preaching the exact same sermons I had been preaching. There was no new truth, but now they were much more effective. And hundreds of people would get saved every time he spoke. And he went to England, he started preaching in these different campaigns and revivals around the country, and historians estimate that over a million people were saved through his ministry. And if you read his autobiography for the rest of his life, he was so passionate about teaching people to pursue the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I can attest to the same thing in my own life, that when I fully embraced the Holy Spirit and what he has for us, that he wanted to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, and I knew I need his power. I can't do this in my own life. It made all the difference in my life. I know what it's like to be saved without this. It's, di it's a whole different experience uh, having the power of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to have that power, how it gives you boldness to witness, and it makes you so much more effective for God. So we've been talking about salvation, the water, and the Spirit. I want to give you a couple of analogies from the Old Testament. So for the Old Testament Hebrew people, we can all understand and agree that Moses was a type of Savior for them. He was a type of Jesus, not Jesus himself. He was a different guy. You'll meet him in heaven if you're a believer. He was a type of savior. He delivered God's people from slavery in Egypt. So they thought of him as their deliverer, okay? So let's, let's kind of read this, knowing that Acts 3 talks about Moses as a type of savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 6 and 11 say that this is written as an example for us. So here's what we see. They were baptized into Moses. That was their savior. They were baptized in the sea. That was the type of water baptism that God's people experienced as they came out of slavery in Egypt. And they were baptized in the cloud, the cloud which is the Holy Spirit, who led God's people as a cloud by day and fire by night. The pillar of this cloud, it rested over the tabernacle. 
where God's presence dwelt. They were baptized in the cloud. This is an analogy for us today. It's a really cool imagery of what was to come that we also can be baptized into our Savior in water and in the Holy Spirit. Here's another analogy, another way to understand this. In the Old Testament, oftentimes oil represents the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you'll read different accounts. I'll give you one example. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, this is when David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So we see there is a connection, a symbolism between this, this oil which was anointed upon David and the Holy Spirit coming powerfully upon him. So I, I say that because I want to point out this next thing. I want to make this clear for us. I want to talk about the tabernacle of Moses. This is where the priest came to worship God. All right, and God gave Moses this vision of the tabernacle in heaven. And he said, what you see here, draw this on earth, create this on earth. So let me show you what the tabernacle looks like. Okay, here's the tabernacle. If you were gonna go into the tabernacle, here's what would happen. First, there was only one way in. The same way that there's only one way to God through Jesus. Then what you would experience, you'd see a bronze altar. And this is where blood sacrifices were made for the forgiveness of sins. Then as you went forward, you would see a bronze basin or laver, laver. I don't know if I'm saying that right. We don't use that word. It's like a wash basin and you would wash with water. Then as you went forward, you would go into what was called the holy place. In the holy place, there was different ways that you worshiped. And then you went, continued forward into the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that's where God's presence dwelt. So let me just kind of draw this connection as you came into, the t into this tabernacle, right? You had to make a sacrifice. Blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. The same way that we have to experience salvation through the blood of Jesus, which was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, right? We have to experience that to come to God. Then as they went forward, they washed in the water of this bronze basin. The same way that we're supposed to get baptized in water as a symbol of our new life in Christ. Now, let me point this next thing out. They went into the holy place and there was another thing that had to happen for them to go forward. They had to be anointed with oil. There was a flask of oil inside the holy place and they were told to pour it on like all over the place in there. There was an altar of incense and a table of showbread. They were supposed to pour oil on everything and they were anointed in oil, showing and symbolizing that the Holy Spirit was with them. Then they were able to go forward into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelt. Now we know that today through Jesus, we have access to God through him. And we all want to be close to God. We all wanna experience the presence of God. We wanna walk with him and be near him and hear him. And so this is what God has for us today. The same process exists for us today. But here's where a lot of Christians get tripped up, okay? They come in, this is the alternate route they take. And they'll say, okay, I'm cool with Jesus. So I accept that the blood of Jesus was shed for me and I'll get water baptized. Cause that's cool. You know, if the water's warm and it's not cold outside, like I'll get baptized in water. Um, but then they'll say uh, that Holy Spirit stuff, that's weird. So I don't really want anything to do with that. And see, the, the problem is, if you know your Bible, that doesn't work. In the Old Testament, if they did not follow God's instructions and they went into the Holy of Holies on their own terms, you know what happened? They, they died, okay? Like, that's why when the priests went in there, they would tie a rope around his ankle in case he died, they could like pull him out, right? I'm glad I don't have to tie a rope around my ankle before I come up to, come up to preach on Sunday, right? Like, just pull me back. Um, and I'm not saying that if you don't experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will literally die. But what I am saying is I encounter Christians all the time who believe in Jesus, but they feel spiritually dead and their life has no power. Their life has no power. So if you wanna be effective for God, if you wanna experience all that God has for you, you need to experience this baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's from Jesus, okay? So we know that it's from Jesus. He's amazing. We can trust him. He's our friend. So it's gonna be good. It's not bad. It's not evil. It's not demonic or anything like that. It's a good gift and that we should want it. We can trust Jesus. And I wanna point this out. We receive Jesus by faith, right? We receive him by faith. 
and we have faith that we're saved. In the same way, we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. So we have to have faith and believe. I, be I receive the Holy Spirit's baptism and I believe I am baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so what I'm gonna do in a minute is for those of you who want to receive this baptism with the Holy Spirit that Jesus wants to give you, I'm gonna invite you to stand and I'm gonna talk you through this. I don't want you to be afraid of it. It's not gonna be weird. I'm not even gonna ask you to speak in tongues because I want you to understand that that's not the focus of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and that should be our focus as well. I'm gonna talk about tongues next week and that it's a benefit. I don't, I don't love the word evidence because it makes it sound like you're trying to prove something to someone or that someone's judging your experience, but it's a benefit. I'm gonna talk about it so you'll wanna hear that, but we're not even talking about that right now. We're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the focus. And if you say, I want that, I'm open to it. Here's how I think that we, that we do this. We ask for it and we surrender to God. We say, God, I desire more of you and I'm gonna surrender to you and I'm gonna trust you. I believe that when we ask, God will give it to us. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. He said, knock and the door will be open to you. He said, you have a father in heaven who is a good father and he loves to give you good gifts. So Jesus made this analogy. He said, if you ask him for bread, he's not gonna give you a stone. If you ask him for a fish to eat, he's not gonna give you a snake, right? So I think also if we ask him for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, he's not gonna mess with us or give us some kind of counterfeit thing that's not good for us. He's only gonna give us a good gift, okay? So if you're here, maybe you came from a different background where you weren't really taught about this. I just want you to swallow your pride. I wanna invite you. If you say, I want this, I'm open to it. I want everything that God has for me. Right now, I'm just gonna invite you to stand. You're gonna stand here in the room. Go ahead and stand if you would like to experience that. And I'm just gonna invite you to pursue this with me. And so here's what we're gonna do, okay? So this is for you. You can still stand if you want to. You didn't miss your chance. You can still stand if you'd like to. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask you to bow your head and just close your eyes because it's a personal experience between you and God. And I want you just to kind of lift your hands just at your sides like this, just in the posture of receiving, just to say, God, I receive everything you have for me, just physically showing that. And I just want you to pray with me. But first, let me just say this. Some of you might want to really quick just ask the Holy Spirit to forgive you if you have believed some things about him that aren't good or maybe aren't true. So maybe you've been afraid of him or you've kind of kept him at arm's length. You can just tell him, hey, I'm sorry that I believe some things about you that aren't true. I want to have a good relationship with you and I want to receive you fully. So now I just want you to open your mouth. You can just repeat after me and just pray this yourself. Just say, Jesus, I ask you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you for each and every one of these Christians who are here who have asked and received the Holy Spirit by faith. Lord, I believe that you have every good gift for them and that you want to bless them and give them power to be effective for you. God, I pray that you would cover them from their head down to their toe with your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you that you love us and we ask you for that same power that the disciples experienced in Acts chapter two. God, we ask you for that in our lives today. So let me just tell you, church, you receive it by faith. So let me just ask you, just pray this out loud. Just say, Lord, I receive it. I receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God is good. I'm going to invite the rest of you to stand with me. And we're just going to go into a time. Just give God praise for a minute. So let's just lift our voices to God. He is good. His grace is good. His mercy endures forever. He deserves our praises. Come on, let's sing this out.